Well, I can definitely date when I entered the Hyborian age for the first time. It was weekend in March the 8th, 1975. And then that's when this comic came out, Savage Sword of Conan, uh, 8p it cost. Um, yeah, if, if, if you're outside the UK, just a, a, a little bit of explanation um, before I uh, move on, in that uh, in the UK, always in the UK, our comics, unlike the American ones, uh, they weren't monthly, they were weekly, they were bigger, they were A4-sized, and um, it was very rare that you would have, well, in fact, I can't even think of, you know, back in the 70s, any comic that just had one story in it. Um, they were all anthologies, usually two or three uh, titles inside. Um, and in the case of um, Marvel UK, which was up and running by this time, um, you had two or three strips in there, um, divided up. So, uh, yeah, you never got a whole story like you would with an American 30-page comic. Uh, you would get maybe three or four pages, and then you had to w ha uh, wait a week for the, f for the next issue. All right? And the other crucial, crucial difference there is uh, between the UK comics when I was growing up and the American comics that I, 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 I was buying when I was growing up is the UK comics, apart from the, uh, the center pages and the covers, uh, were black and white, all right? Um, and throughout the 70s, um, I don't think I ever bought um, American Marvel comics. So to me, all Marvel comics were black and white, as you can see here with this first issue with old Barry Windsor Smith, you know? Um, and that's the way it was. It, it's jarring, actually. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be referring to to this book in a minute, all right? And it is jarring to see this story. Let's find that page. It's jarring to see this story. Um, oh, no, I've gone too far. Um, let's go from the beginning. All right, let's have that one, all right? It's jarring to see that when we're used to that, all right? Um, and it wasn't just uh, Savage Sword of Conan. Um, it was all the titles. It was the superhero comics, the Spider-Man, you know, Mighty World of Marvel, um, the Avengers comic. Um, and it continued throughout um, the 70s. Give you an example here. Dracula Lives. All right. Um, I've never seen um, the 70s version of Dracula, the Gene Colan one, in colour. To me, it's always black and white, and especially with, you, you know, Dracula Lives, this helped the mood, the living mummy there. And what else have we got? Always three, as I say. Um, Werewolf by Night, all right? Always like this, all right? Yeah, and usually something on the back cover. And it was continuing right up into the 70s and into the 80s. I mean, look, here we go, Star Wars Weekly. It's really odd for me to see a, a Star Wars comic in colour, all right? Because to me, and I'm guessing everyone my generation that was buying all these comics, that's what it was, all right? Um, conversely, um, DC Comics, there was never a, a, a UK version of what Marvel was doing if you see what I mean. Um, yeah, all my DC comics were um, were colour because I was getting the American monthlies. Anyway, preamble out the way. Oh, one other thing. Um, as I say, the original Conan comic, black and white, all right? Three years after this, we got the Savage Sword of Conan come out. And um, this... I know in America was black and white, and um, you, you, you know, for for me, I mean, um, John Buscema, Buscema, he to me is the definitive Conan artist. I mean, look at this, especially when you've got Alfredo Acala doing uh, the inking. I mean, uh, just just stunning. This is Conan 
when I read the books, this is who I'm seeing, all right? Um, that's why, you know, as good as the um, Arnie Conan films are, this is my Conan, right? And Arnie ain't him, all right? So, all that out of the way. Um, hang on a second, I've just got to pause. And off we go again. Yeah, so, um, up until about 78, that was my Conan world, right? Just adjusting my mic, hopefully you're not hearing that too much. And then, um, when I was in my college years and uh, deeply getting into uh, uh, fantasy novels, um, I discovered the real deal, the Robert E. Howard books, all right? And as good as the comics were, the way Robert E. Howard wrote those books, how, you know, fantastically he described things, I, I, I completely and utterly fell in love with the world of Conan. And, um, and I lapped these up. Um, these are the ones I've had. I mean, back then it was £1.75. Um, what year was I buying this? What, what is this? Um, oh, this is 84. Um, so I, this is a quite late one, but I know I was getting these uh, in the late 70s. All right. And just fell in love with his world. And every so often, uh, say about a year or so, I whip out this mighty tome which is a collection of all of his works all right uh, I, i'm a bit of a conan purist i i um i i i really only think of conan in the pure written by robert e howard stories not the ones that there were transcripts found after his death and you know um uh Le Sprague, the camp and, and, and others continue them. To me, I'm a purist and it is those 20 odd, you know, um, short stories and one uh, full length novel that are Conan to me. All right. So that's that preamble out of the way. What I'm going to do today, a bit unusual for my channel. Um, there is one story, there is one Conan story, which is my favourite. And since I first read it, and I think I first read it in the in the weekly because I know Roy Thomas and um, Barry Windsor Smith did do an, an adaptation of it in, and it was printed in the weekly. Um, is just look at my favourite short story. It's only twenty two pages long. All right, and it's called the Tower of the Elephant. All right, and in a nutshell. Um, the story takes place in the early days of Conan the Mercenary. I mean, he's either in his late teens or early 20s, and I really like that because I like the early early stories of Conan before he becomes this, you know, um, a world-travelling, been there, done it all, quite boastful Conan. This is a, a kid Conan, and, um, you know, he's not shy for making friends, teaming up you know, asking questions, which you don't get when, you, you, you know, he's 10, 20 years older. So basically, the story is Conan is in this, um, uh, in this city in an area called the Mall. Um, it, the story starts where you've got this braggart who's boasting about how he's going to be rich because he's going to kidnap a woman. Um, and in his bragging, he mentions the Tower of the Elephant. And uh, Conan comes along, taps him on the shoulder and goes, I've heard about this Tower of the Elephant. Um, there's meant to be like uh, the heart of the elephant, this fabulous jewel um, inside the tower. How come it's never been robbed? You know, and um, the braggart mocks him. Um, Conan feels humiliated by it. He goes on about, you know, Yara, the sorcerer, lives in the tower and, um, you, you know, mocks Conan, pushes it a bit too far. The lights go out, the lights come up. The guy is dead. Conan's gone. Conan goes to the sector of the city where all the temples are, um, finds this, this huge 150 feet tall tower, decides he's going to... Uh, to rob it and get the heart of the elephant. He, he's outside the first wall. He hears a guard go by, jumps over that first wall, uh, sneaks through the undergrowth, finds the, um, finds the guard dead. He literally bumps into Taurus, the Prince of Thieves, and um, 
you know, an older Conan would have killed him where he stood. But 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 this is Taurus, Prince of Thieves. They decide to team up. They're going to share the the rewards. They climb over the second wall, um, have a close encounter with six lions, climb the tower, um, get to the top. Taurus says, wait outside, Conan. I'm just going to check inside, make sure the coast is clear. Uh, Conan's a bit suspicious of this. Taurus then comes out, groans, dies. All he's got is uh, um, three marks on the back of his neck um, with a faint whiff of putrefaction. And I like this um, in this story. Conan is no bonehead. You know, he's intelligent. He, he, he's worked out that it can't be darts because if it was darts in the neck, then they would still be there. What is it? He goes through the door that Taurus had gone through and uh, he enters a chamber with, you know, you know, lavishly laid out. No sign of a, of a, um, of, of, of a threat. Crosses the room. That's when, uh, uh, like, a giant spider drops down. He has a fight with the spider, manages to kill the spider. Continues down to the tower, into the tower. And he meets, let me see if, yeah, we've got an illustration just here. Okay. This is the only illustration there is in this book of um, Yag Kosha, actually he's called Yag Kosha and Yoga, all right? This uh, human form, but with an elephant head, alien. This is the only time in the Conan stories where there's actually specification that aliens have come to Earth, and he is the last of his kind. They were um, um, exiled from their planet of Yag. They used to have huge wings on their backs, and they flew through the stars, they arrived at Earth before man had evolved. Um, they're not immortal, but they live the life of planets um, and stars. And <clears throat> slowly they see man, uh, man uh, evolve. They see the first civilizations um, of Atlantis, etc., etc. They see them crumble. They see man revert to uh, it, its primitive form and then rise again. And they all died off, apart from... Yag, who is then worshipped by God down in the uh, in the jungles of Shem. Um, one day Yara comes along. This is hundreds of years before Conan's time. Um, uh, sits at his feet, begs to be uh, be taught the uh, the white magic of Yag, which uh, he does. But then he tricks Yag into teaching him black magic, and by doing that, he enslaves him. And he's had them there for God knows how many years, torturing him to get more and more secrets. He's blind. He's been blinded. He's been tortured on the rack. All right. And uh, he asks Conan to, to, uh, to, to kill him, get his sword, drive it through his heart, remove the heart, take it across to a table where there is a red jewel, squeeze the blood from the heart onto the jewel, take it down to Yara and, and present it to Yara which Conan does. Um, Yara screams. He starts to shrink. I don't know how he ends up on the table. He ends up on the table and he shrinks and shrinks and shrinks until he's absorbed by the stone. Conan looks in there and he can see this image of, of Yara and Yag. Yag is reborn in the crystal. He's got his wings back. Conan flees, gets outside the tower just as um, it crumbles. All right, so that's it. In a, in a nutshell. So what I'm going to do today is, as I say, Robert E. Howard had a way with him um, with, uh, with words. So what I thought I'd do is I've got three versions of that story. I haven't got it in the black and white weekly version, but I have got the colorized version in this Chronicles of Conan. All right. I've also got the black and white version from the Savage Sword of Conan, all right? And then I've got my most modern one is from uh, in this one. This is, by the way, I haven't said, this is Kurt Busiak and Gary Nord. This is um, Roy Thomas and John Buscema. And this is Roy Thomas again with Barry Windsor Smith. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm not that, good at reading so I don't know, really know why I'm doing this. I'm going to read a bit you know from the book and then we're going to see in all three cases how that um, 
how that comes across. All right. <clears throat> so the first bit we're going to look at is Conan tapping the guy on the shoulder. All right. Um, and asking about, you know, this Tower of the Elephant. Um, so the guy is tapped on the shoulder. He turns around um, and Robert E. Howard says, the Cothian involuntarily drew back for the man was not one of any civilized race he knew. You spoke of the Elephant Tower, said the stranger, speaking Zamorian with an alien accent. I've heard much of this tower. What is its secret? The fellow's attitude did not seem threatening and the Cothian's courage was bolstered up by the ale and the evident approval of his audience. He swelled with self-importance. The secret of the elephant tower, he exclaimed, why any fool knows that Yara, the priest, dwells there with the great jewel men call the elephant's heart that is the secret of his magic. The barbarian digested this for a space. I have seen this tower, he said. It is set in a great garden above the level of the city, surrounded by high walls. I have seen no guards. The walls would be easy to climb. Why has not somebody stolen this secret gem? All right, so let's see how that is depicted, firstly, by Barry Windsor Smith. And here we are. And again, I just find it very jarring to, to read a 70s Conan in colour. So here we are. Here's the tap on the shoulder. Here's our introduction to Conan. Okay. And here's the uh, mistake the guy makes. The lights go out and he's found dead. All right. Then, Roy Thomas on scripting again. Look at that for an introduction to our hero in this tale. I mean, Gordon Bennett. Look at that line work. Amazing. Amazing. Here we go. Will you mock me and lay hands on me? Let's just see the, the braggart's demise. Yeah, lights go out. And there he lays dead. All right. And then in the Gary Nord version, Interesting use of angles to show Conan. Very similar in uh, in appearance, this guy, to the last one. Here he is being mocked. As I say, an older Conan would have had his head off immediately. And there he is, dead. All right. So let's move on. What's my next bit? Yeah, now the next bit's interesting because the, this is in the book, but it's not in the first two versions. Only the Kurt Busiak, Gary Nord version shows this, um, which is when Conan is walking to the sector of the city that um, contains the, um, that contains all the temples of the different uh, sorcerers and priests of all the different gods. Um, it says, he thought of Yara, the high priest, who worked strange dooms from this jeweled tower, and the Sumerian's hair prickled as he remembered a tale told by a drunken page of the court, how Yara had laughed in the face of a hostile prince and held up a glowing evil gem before him, and how rays shot blindingly from that unholy jewel to envelop the prince, who screamed and fell down and shrank to a withered blackened lump that changed to a black spider, which scampered wildly about the chamber until Yara set his heel upon it. All right, and that is just here. We get a nice introduction to Yara. Here's the guy having a blackened lump and then a spider and then squelch, right? Only this version shows that, which I found quite curious. Um, so yeah, Conan jumps the first wall, finds the dead soldier, and then almost bumps into a guy. And it says, you are no stranger, hiss the, you are no soldier, hiss the stranger at last. You are a thief like myself. And who are you? Asked the Sumerian in a suspicious whisper. Taurus of Nemedia. 
The Sumerian lowered his sword. I've heard of you. Men call you a prince of thieves. A low laugh answered him. Taurus was tall as the Sumerian and heavier. He was big-bellied and fat, but his every movement betokened a subtle dynamic magnetism, which was reflected in the keen eyes that glinted vitally even in the starlight. He was barefooted and carried a coil of what looked like a thin, strong rope knotted at regular intervals. All right, so we get... Excuse me. Here we go. Is this what you just thought of from that description? He's not very pot bellied, is he? But there he is. All right, and then here's a brief look at the, uh, the lions that attack, but Taurus has got a pipe filled with powder from the black lotus, which instantly kills them. Well, all but one. All right. Then we've got... Here he is. Here's his introduction here. Again, look at this artwork. And here they go, going up over the second wall. And this is more like it. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> That's what I'm seeing. All right, very nice. Well done. That's really, really good. Right, so next bit, moving on. So the next bit I'm going to read is them. Um, they've dispatched the lions. They've got to climb this 100 foot, 50 foot tower, which I haven't said, but you know, the, the, the whole of the top of it is bejeweled and it, and, and it gleams and glistens. Um, up and up they went, silently, the lights of the city spreading out further and further to the site, to their sight as they climbed, the stars above them more and more dimmed by the glitter of the jewels along the rim. Now Taurus reached up a hand and gripped the rim itself, pulling himself up and over. Conan paused a moment on the very edge, fascinated by the great frosty jewels whose gleams dazzled his eyes. Diamonds, rubies, emeralds, sapphires, turquoises, moonstones, set thick as stars in the shimmering silver. At a distance, their different gleams had seemed to merge into a pulsing white glare. But now, at close range, they shimmered with a million rainbow tints and lights, hypnotising him with their scintillations. There is a fabulous fortune here, Taurus, he whispered, but the Nemedian answered impatiently, Come on, if we secure the heart, these and all other things shall be ours. All right. Like I say, he, he was brilliant at describing things. So, here we go. Barry Windsor-Smith, or unless this is a recolouring for the collection, has the actual tower shimmering like mad. Look at those beautiful colours. That's not quite how it's described the, in, in, in the book. Only the very summit of the tower is bejeweled. But there they go. Here we go. There is a fabulous fortune here, Taurus. And there they go, climbing the top. All right. So that's that one. In this one. Unfortunately, of course, it being black and white, Kind of hard to convey us. There is a fabulous fortune here, Taurus. And Kerry has got. Here they go, climbing up. Up and up they went silently. Rather less jewels in this version than I um I uh, I, I imagined. And in here, Conan's actually describing, there's an addition to the script, where he's actually describing all the jewels, all right? So, next bit we've got <coughs> is, before we cut off our last retreat, hissed Taurus, go you to the rim and look over on all sides. If you see any soldiers moving in the gardens or anything suspicious, return and tell me. I will await you within this chamber. 
Conan saw scant reason in this, and a faint suspicion of his companion touched his wary soul, but he did as Taurus requested. As he turned away, the Nemedian slept in, slept, slipped inside the door and drew it shut behind him. Conan crept about the rim of the tower, returning to his starting point without having seen any suspicious movement in the vaguely waving sea of leaves below. He turned towards the door. Suddenly from within the chamber there sounded a strangled cry. And so, we have... A rather dramatic uh, 70s... Ah, ah! What's that? A strangled cry from within. within. Is this some sort of civilised trick? Hmm. Um, it, it's nice. It's nice how, you know, that they're putting into words, you know, what um, Conan was thinking in the book. All right. So he screams, out comes Taurus. Dead, says Conan to no one. Um, and you've got a couple of wounds on the neck. All right. that is Taurus telling Conan what to do. Conan sees sc scant reason for this and indeed a faint suspicion of his companion abruptly touches his naturally wary soul. And here he is coming out with a grug this time. And here's the three marks on his neck. All right. We've got sound effect in the third one. Let's have a look. We get a or something. Out he comes. He gets a bit of last words in this version. And then Conan finds three small wounds at the base of his neck. Poison darts, perhaps. No, no. If it were, the missiles would still be in the wounds. Right. Now we come up to the spider. So he goes into the room. Oh, missed the page. Yeah. He was in the centre of the room now, going stooped forward, head thrust out warily, sword advanced, when again death struck at him soundlessly. A flying shadow that swept across the gleaming floor was his only warning, and his instinctive sidelong leap all that saved his life. He had a flashing glimpse of a hairy black horror that swung past him with a clashing of frothing fangs and something splashed on his bare shoulder that burned like drops of liquid hellfire. Springing back, sword high, he saw the horror strike the floor, wheel and scuttle towards him with appalling speed. A gigantic black spider, such as men see only in nightmare dreams. It was as large as a pig and its eight thick, hairy legs drove its ogreish body over the floor at headlong pace. Its four evilly gleaming eyes shone with a horrible intelligence, and its fangs dripped venom that, Ken, that Conan knew from the burning of his shoulder, where only a few drops had splashed as the thing struck and missed, was laden with swift death. This was the killer that had dropped from its perch in the middle of the ceiling on a strand of its web, on the neck of the Nemedian. Fools that they were not to have suspected that the upper chambers would be guarded as well as the lower. So, let's have a look at the depictions of the ogreish pig-sized spider, shall we? Here we go. He gets the, the drops on his shoulder. And there's the spider. It's, it's not ogreish to me. It's... Um, it's a bit underwhelming, but at least he's got four eyes. All right. And then we have in this, all revealed in just two pages. Hmm. Again, I don't know. And are they four eyes or are they two eyes and two nostrils? I don't know. And then finally, we have splash on his shoulder, and then there we are. Okay, and 
that's that button. So the next bit is my favorite bit in the book. And yeah, this is gonna be a uh, quite a long read. Sorry about this. Uh, let, me, let me give you a picture of Yag to look at while I, and the spider, while I um, read this. Um, so yeah, he's dispatched the spider. He goes down the stairs, he reaches another door. Cautiously, he pressed against the ivory door and it swung silently inward. On the shimmering thres threshold, Conan stared like a wolf in strange surroundings, ready to fight or flee on the instant. He was looking into a large chamber with a domed golden ceiling. The walls were of green jade, the floor of ivory, partly covered by thick rugs. Smoke and exotic scent of incense floated up from a brazier on a golden tripod, and behind it sat an idol of a, on, on a sort of marble couch. Conan stared aghast. The image had the body of a man naked and green in colour, but the head was one of nightmare and madness. Too large for the human body, it had no attributes of humanity. Conan stared at the wide flaring ears, the curling proboscis, on either side of which stood white tusks tipped with round golden balls. The eyes were closed as if in sleep. This then was the reason for the name of the Tower of the Elephant, for the head of the thing was much like that of the beast described by the Shemish Wanderer. This was Yara's god, where, where then should the gem be, but kept concealed in the idol since the stone was called the elephant's heart. As Conan came forward, his eyes fixed on the motionless idol, the eyes of the thing opened suddenly. The Sumerian froze in his tracks. It was no image, it was a living thing, and he was trapped in its chamber. That he did not instantly explode in a burst of murderous frenzy is a fact that measures his horror, which paralysed him where he stood. A civilised man in his position would have sought doubtful refuge in the conclusion that he was insane. It did not occur to the Sumerian to doubt his senses. He knew he was face to face with a demon of the elder world, and the realisation robbed him of all his faculties except sight. The trunk of the horror was lifted and quested about. The topaz eyes stared unseeingly, and Conan knew the monster was blind. With the thought came a thawing of his frozen nerves, and he began to back silently towards the door. But the creature heard. The sensitive trunk stretched towards him, and Conan's horror froze him again when the being spoke in a strange, stammering voice that never changed its key or timbre. The Sumerian knew that those jaws were never built or intended for human, human speech. Who is here? Have you come to torture me again, Yara? Will you never be done? O oh, Yag Kosha, is there no end to agony? Tears rolled from the sightless eyes and Conan's gaze strayed to the limbs stretched on the marble couch and he knew the monster would not rise to attack him. He knew the marks of the rack and the searing brand of the flame and tough souled as he was, he stood aghast at the ruined deformities which his reason told him had once been limbs as comely as his own. And suddenly all fear and repulsion went from him to be replaced by a great pity. What this monster was, Conan could not know, but the evidences of its sufferings were so terrible and pathetic that a strange aching sadness came over the Sumerian. He knew not why. He only felt that he was looking upon a cosmic tragedy and he shrank with shame as if the guilt of the whole race were laid upon him. I am not Yara, he said. I am only a thief. I will not harm you. Come near that I may touch you, the creature faltered, and Conan came nearer, came nearer unfearingly, his sword hanging forgotten in his hand. The sensitive trunk came out and groped over his face and shoulders as a blind man gropes, and its touch was light as a girl's hand. You are not of Yara's race of devils, sighed the creature. The clean, lean fierceness of the wasteland marks you. I know your people from of old, whom I knew by another name in the long, long ago when another world lifted its jewelled spires to the stars. There is blood on your fingers. A spider in the chamber above and a lion in the garden, muttered Conan. You have slain a man too this night, answered the other, and there is death in the tower above. I feel, I know. 
How brilliant is that? Sorry about my reading. My reading is not good, but man, oh man, oh man, I love this story. I love it dearly. And that, I think, is the highlight, right? So let's see how that was depicted. Here we go. Again, I don't know if, if the original comic was as vibrant a green as this, but here we are. Not as, as, as broken as, uh, as the novel would suggest. And I'm just going to turn over and this. I'm going to show you in all three cases the account of them coming to Earth. Ending with Yag pleading with Conan to kill him. All right. Then here we go. I mean, God, blimey, John, John, you were a master, you really were. And then the flight across the heavens. This is far more detailed this time round. You see man evolving, you see the rising of the cities, you see the degeneration and the coming back up again. There's old Yara. And then tricking him. All right. And then <clears throat> this is far more how I see it when I read the book. This is far more accurate. Beautiful, beautiful work. Oh, look at him, look at him. Here, we get a change of artists for the tale of how they came to earth. It's quite detailed, beautiful art. And here we go, ending with Conan driving his sword into his chest. All right. And then we have one last piece, which is when Yara has been presented with the jewel and he starts shrinking and somehow ends up on the table and like the incredible shrinking man shrinks 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 and then goes into the into the uh, jewel it says and suddenly he sank into the very heart of the jewel as a man sinks into a sea and conan saw the smoky waves close over his head now he saw him in the crimson heart of the jewel, once more crystal clear as a man sees us seen far away, tiny with great distance. And into the heart came a green, shining, winged figure with the body of a man and the head of an elephant, no longer blind nor crippled. Yara threw up his arms and fled as a madman flees, and on his heels came the avenger. Then, like the bursting of a bubble, the great jewel vanished in, the rain, in a rainbow burst of iridescent gleams, and the ebony tabletop lay bare and deserted. As bare, Conan knew somehow, as the marble couch in the chamber above, where the body of that strange trans transcosmic being called Yag Kosha and Yoga had lain. And at the end, it just says, once he had fled the... Uh, the tower. He turned back uncertainly to stare at the cryptic tower he had just left. Was he bewitched and enchanted? Had he dreamed all that had seemed to have passed? As he looked, he saw the gleaming tower sway against the crimson dawn, its jewel-crusted rim sparkling in the growing light, and crash into shining shards. And that is here. Here he is. Yara being confronted, Yara shrinking, shrinking in, 
methane yag kosher that's a lovely shot of it shattering and falling All right john has it oh, look at it oh blimey look at that Flees down, finds all the guards dead. Yeah, Kosher has killed the guards that were at the bottom. And there it is, crumbly. And then we have drinking, shrinking, somehow on the table. Excellent. And this is lovely. Look at that shot. There it is crumbling. Conan walking away in the spiritual form of the Agkosha going back to the stars. Um, so there you go. Um, my favourite Conan story depicted three ways visually. Uh, one other thing to say um, about this collection, which is Dark Horse, isn't it? Yeah, Dark Horse. Um, towards the back, you've got concept drawings. This is by someone called Ladron. I think he was the guy who was first going to uh, draw it. And you can see here, he's trying to make an elephant-like head that isn't an elephant, you know. We've got some more there. It's saying he went through nearly a dozen designs. Oh, yeah, it was Michael Wim. No, Michael Wim Kaluta uh, doing the Across the Stars prehistory thing. So there we are. And there. And this is warm up sketches by Carrie Nord for Yakosha. So there you go. Uh, something a little bit different uh, for you today. Um, as I say, once a year, I return to the Hyborian Age, and um, and oh, ding, and uh, yeah, I think that's my ding to say it's about to start time to start uh, uh, reading again. <laughs>